The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. And we're coming to you in Panavision today, so for those of you who aren't watching us, you're hearing us. If you're used to your ears bleeding, your eyes may learn to bleed as well. So apologies in advance, but obviously not for our guest. Um, today I'm joined by a wonderful woman who has a multitude of interests and also professional roles within the financial services industry. Today we're going to focus a lot on her own engine room, her own business. Her name is Amy Baker and she is the CEO of Recap Advice. Welcome, Amy. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for uh, being um, part of our first uh, video session, which is um, quite frankly horrifying for me, <laughs> but uh, um, I think we picked pretty well. Now, we had a bit of a conversation um, off air, mm-hmm. and you've been doing this for a while, and your name pops up, and you've been a guest previously giving insights with Ensemble, but today I want to focus on you. So what's your story and give me maybe some of the learnings you've learned along the way because it's interesting. Oh, God, where do we start? I have so many stories. I started my career in financial services oh, nearly 20 years ago. Um, so I actually wasn't trained initially as a financial planner. I didn't even know what financial planning was. I think that's I th- many great advisors I hear have sort of find it it's the accidental career. I would actually go further and say it's a vocation because no one in their right mind would really do what we do if they understood the work that is involved as an advisor. We do it because we love it and we're passionate about our client outcomes. But my stories, there are so many. I guess the first thing is how I came across advice was working at St. George Bank in collections. I was terrible at that job because I had to get lots of promises to pay um, in terms of people who owed money to the bank. And I was supposed to do that within, you know, a call would drop in. I had literally a few seconds to get them to say when they were going to pay and how much. But I always wanted to understand why they were in the situation and how I could help them. So I kind of get stuck on that call. I always got the promises to pay, but I didn't meet those KPIs because I wasn't getting the calls in. So you weren't doing it fast enough. I wasn't doing it fast enough, exactly. But Uh, providing a great social service. Correct, exactly. And what I discovered, and this was around the same time as me going, all right, I need to actually – get a better education outside of performing arts and I was trained as singer and actor. Well, 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 rewind, rewind. That. So so your first passion and career was in the performing arts. Correct. So take me through that. Well, I just, I've always, I, I did a diploma of performing arts whilst also at high school. Yep. Um, I always in musicals and whatnot and then I started training as a singer. I think I did about 12 years of training in jazz music. Um, I and sort of got into, you know, NIDA and dropped out and all sorts of things. The reality was when I was working in hospitality, as you do in that sort of field, and you get a gig in music and you find yourself needing nights to do rehearsals and actual gigs, I needed a day job. And all of a sudden I was like, what am I going to do with myself? So I found myself working at um, 
you know, in a business, uh, all of a sudden it was admin, next thing I'm doing their bookkeeping, next thing I'm actually looking at their finances and trying to help them along. So I already had an eye for, in, and I guess, an understanding of the mechanics of money and sort of went, okay, maybe that's where I'm going to go. When my son was born in 2004, um, I sort of went, this isn't a real career path. Like I didn't feel confident that I was going to just grow in that field of just sort of like working in a business as a bookkeeper, so to speak. And so I went, okay, I need to work out what I've got to do. And I think Kay was around 11 weeks old when I started at St. George Bank. I got to work in the afternoon. So from, you know, I think 4 p.m. till 9 p.m. And this was collecting, uh, take, sorry, providing a social service that happened <laughs> yes. to also collect money for the bank. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, and then it was very soon thereafter that I discovered financial advice. It was actually having a conversation with my manager and I was looking at RMIT. I was looking at universities where I could work, rem- like study remotely with a newborn baby. And she was like, financial advice. And I was like, what is that? And once I discovered what it was, I was like, absolutely, that's where I want to go. And the bank basically really fast-tracked my study. So they went, defer from university. We're going to put you through Tribeca. It was pretty straightforward. And I went straight to the wealth team into insurance. I was looking after um, Perth and South Australia because I was working afternoons and evenings. Got it. Got it. And um, and then all of a sudden, you know, a second baby came along, third baby came along. Uh, The merge was happening, the GFC was going on. It was a pretty crazy time to be in financial services. Sort of next thing, the people I was speaking to over in Perth were next door to me in Asgard and BT. It was all kind of happening um, all at once. It was really fast. It was crazy fast. Because you mentioned that your your first uh, son um, was born in 2004, and I can remember getting my first AFSL in 2003, and I think that was when DFP8 sort of became a thing for everyone here who's Correct. gone through DFP8, the Masters of Financial Planning, CFP, et cetera. DFP8 was a big lockstep jump up mm-hmm. um, and it kind of gave that's us helpful. a- Yeah, that's right. It um, it, it gave us that, that, that proper financial plan. So you started your career just as I would say the coming of age for, for the beginning of, of real holistic planning. Would that be yeah, fair to say? Absolutely. And I kind of got thrown into private practice- very quickly as well because although I was kicking KPIs and I actually had won an award at the bank um, in that team, it it was, you know, focused on the fact that I was actually working part-time. So I was really proud of myself for my achievements. Um, My youngest son was born with severe hip dysplasia and he needed to be in hospital a lot. And so I had to take a lot of leave unpaid. I remember the the conversation having with uh, with my manager and she said, it doesn't look good. And I'm like, I'm not getting paid. I'm not taking annual leave or sick leave. It's And I've kicked my KPIs. What's the problem? She goes, yeah. From memory, the bank was making a fair few dollars profit at the time. Yeah, right? it was crazy. And I was like, um, okay, but what do I do? And she's like, I think you should have a sabbatical. Take a year off. We'll have a job here when you're ready. And I felt gutted. I was so – because I had a bit of a plan. There was opportunities with BT and Asgard at the time – there were lots of conversations going on, and I felt like that was a bit ripped. I was ripped off from that, so out I went on my own um, into a firm, and the GFC had happened, and this firm had actually done lots of margin loans and whatnot. Uh, and I went, okay, this isn't the kind of business I want to be in. It was a very quick learning curve for me. Yep. But it also in that learning curve was discovering how spoiled you are in an institution like a bank where. A lot of the work just gets handed upstairs, paperwork, um, you know, the underwriting process, for example, um, all the follow-ups that an advisor was, has to do when giving, say, insurance advice. And I found that there was a real need in a, fine, a small practice for that back office service for, especially around that insurance piece. This was before like that telehealth con- you know, concept. Yep. And so I started a, a business then um, and my business partner and I started sort of pounding the pavement, going to all the insurance companies, trying to find small firms and offering this kind of service. So you were providing a engine room for insurance. Yes. Is that right? Correct. Insurance to help people navigate putting their policies in place. The advisors actually, to help the advisors take the work off them, yep. say, you've had the conversation with the client. What well, year was that? Amy? That was in... I was, I'm thinking it was in 2009. That's early doors. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it 
my business partner and I clearly didn't communicate well enough because he sort of felt that we were undervaluing ourselves, not charging enough. So he started to offshore some of the work. And one of my clients, one of our big clients in North Sydney basically pulled me aside and said, who's this person calling us to do this work when we've actually hired you? And I was like, ah. So it was a big lesson to me to actually have more things, you know, agreements and a proper business plan in place when you're going into business partnership. I sort of few little knives in my back there and I was quite gutted about that. At the same time, I was going through a divorce. So it was fun times for all. Um, Sadly, <laughs> you're learning about contracts pretty fast. Yeah, it was like, wow. Um, there was a lot going on there. And by the way, I had three toddlers. You know, Brandon right now would have been about 18 months or nearly two years. The silver lining in this was the business who pulled me aside basically went, come and work with us. Right. We want you to head this division. And where was that? I can't say the business name. Location-wise, Sydney. North Sydney. North Sydney, yep. Yeah, I can't say the business name because they're still around and it didn't end well for right. me because, um, as I mentioned, I was starting – actually, I think I, the divorce started happening when I started there. Yep. Um, but it was just another learning curve where I was promised equity. I wasn't remunerated correctly. Yep. Um, over, I know that, you know, the division I started, small ama- a small profit, but it, it – you know, I – brought in six figures in a small period of time, but I didn't really get to see any of that. So, yeah, I was bit- so, so it's not, it's not sadly not unfamiliar. And, mm. you know, a big part of the reason that that we talk about the engine room, and, and we'll talk about it later on, is sort of, you know, uh, your vision for bringing other people in, how you would treat them. And a lot of people want to be treated the way in which you'll treat other people the way in which they'd like to be treated themselves. Mm. And that's probably going to form up um, kind of where you're at. So when did you kick off? Your business, uh, that's the award-winning one um, uh, that, that we're talking about today. In fact, um, you know, we'll start off with, with a bit of a celebration. Um, you won not one but two awards this year. Is that right or last year? One in 2022, one in 2023. Ah, so what's the name of the business? When did you start it? And then let's go straight into the awards and we'll ski down the okay. positivity. Uh, yeah, let's runway. go back. So just actually that story, I walked out angry after being promised equity and that's when I started this business. I was, I had the fire in my belly and I was like, right, and I haven't looked back. I think it was crazy to do. I started with no clients and no money and absolutely terrified and also divorced and single mum with three kids. So, but... I mean, there was many times I was going to give up. Absolutely. There was many times where um, I didn't think I could make it. And every time I went to give up, an opportunity would fall on my feet. It was like, you know, Can I, I just kept following the pebbles, so to speak. Yep. So faced with that, you've started and then you would bring in, uh, you know, clients. How did you reconcile? Sometimes when people would come in and complain about their financial situation as potential clients, knowing that you were you know, ticking a few pretty large boxes as far as being behind the eight ball. How did that make you feel? And how did you get through it? Um, I had to really grapple with imposter syndrome because, you know, I was driving a crappy car. I was like, a financial advisor is supposed to be wealthy. They're supposed to have their crap, you know, the shit together. Excuse my We can edit that error out later, (laughs) Kieran. Financial advisor is supposed to be, you've, you've got a bunch of financial advisors careering off the road at the moment. Happy. Let's start with happy. Go for it. So I did try to sort of cover up a bit and then- when I started opening up with two, two clients and, you know, they would talk about their situation, I'd go, it's not that bad, you know, in comparison. And I actually started becoming honest and open. And I found that when I did, and I had a conversation with my accountant at the time, and when I actually shared my situation and the fact that I've kept the lights on the roof over my head, um, it made me be, a, you know, very aware that what I'm doing is also practicing what I preach and so I really created a process of um, understanding cash flow is always the foundation to everything. And I would talk to clients about that. So I think once you sort of get over yourself and what you think the world perceives you to be and be who you are, you know, and actually hold on to your values and your ethics, it, it can really shift. And being authentic really was the catalyst to, I guess, my growth because I've never really, I never advertised. My business has built, been built simply on word of mouth and referrals. And and so in 2024, your business has been going for how many years? It's now 11 years in July. 1st of July 2013 is when I started. Congratulations. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a flash car either, but that's, uh, that's because um, 
um, I don't know which train station that gets left at half the time. But um, um, and last year you were awarded a very prestigious investment award, which uh, was a first, which is something we mentioned off air. Yes. So I am very proud of some of my achievements. So I won the two awards. You know, first I'll mention the Female Excellence in Advice Award, which is 2022, and that was something I had had a desire to win for a long time because I was very part of the, you know, big part of the Inspire community. And it's important to recognize women in this field, given that we are quite the minority. So I was very proud of that. But the biggest one was really, I mean, I shouldn't discount that one either. But last year I won IFA's Excellent Award as Investment Advisor of the Year. I was the only woman I'm aware of that's ever won this one. And I was the only woman among nine peers um, and that's something that I'm incredibly proud of because a lot, you know, in the investment space, we're further a minority. Like we don't see many women really wanting to dominate in that space. I'm not sure why, because women make great investors. Um, it has been a very challenging few years in the investment space. Um, and I honestly think that probably the reason why that all, I got that award was maybe how I've directed my clients through the very volatile economic climate that we've been experiencing since, you know, pre- pretty much through the COVID process, but a period and, and beyond. And first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Um, you know, we're going to touch on a few things later on in the, in the podcast in relation to your work with the Asp- Inspire, Aspire and with the FAAA and also um, a few comments that you have around uh, one of the, the big yawning uh, gaps in, in, the, in making it gender equal for young women coming through our industry, which we'll, we'll put a pin in that one. But you gave me a very clearly articulated sort of handicap as far as timings and yeah. whatnot, which we'll make sure we do because there'll be a lot of people listening to that. So maybe if we could just change gears now and talk about the business of your business. As we are today, 11 years in, um, you've, you've lost that imposter syndrome um, and you you also mentioned that you've, you 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 have three boys, but you've also got another addition as well. Cause, uh, yes. So I have you- a four year old as well. So my children range from twenty all the way to four, plus my stepdaughter and son stepson. So twenty four and then twenty, nearly twenty eight. So it's a big range. But the four I've got, my boys and my Gracie. Congratulations! It's um so handling people's finances um must just be a dot when when you're talking to them. So what sort of clients? Um, does your practice, uh, or do you like, and what what have you ended up having? Initially, you start off just a bit hungry and taking on everybody. I think as I've developed, you know, grown, and I've, I say grown, I've grown up, I've actually matured and I've got a bit of a, a, you know, a shifted mindset over the years as well. The clients that I get or I, I serve vary because we've got private wealth clients because we do in-house investments yep. and we've also got our retail clients. Um, and what's the percentage? So you've got a retail, do you have a wholesale capability in your license or you do? Yes. Yeah, so our, our wholesale is small, but it actually in terms of what it brings as you know the business yep. is quite large. As you can appreciate, you're managing someone who might have a portfolio of Fifteen million dollars versus somebody who you know, mum and dad who might have combined super of say four hundred thousand. So it's a bit different, um, and the services obviously you know vary. When, uh, when when did you do the split to to get those clear I articulations? I'd, I'd say we really started about two and a bit years. No regrets. Ago. No regrets. I can tell you, it's been a bumpy ride. I mean, you start servicing whole, like wholesale clients, and you get like your first ten million dollar client walk through the door, and then markets fall out of bed and you've lost them a million dollars overnight it, it doesn't it, it made me feel quite sick at some points and you have to harden up but um you've also got to look at really what is your investment thesis why are you you know why are you doing what you're doing and um you know you're constantly having these conversations with your clients around what's going on in the markets and it's an incredible amount of trust the building a sort of i guess the private wealth space is a slow burn. It's huge amounts of trust. There, you know, you might also find that there are the client has multiple advisors, and you know, so they're, they're testing the water with you. They've got someone else. They might just have also a broker, and you know, they're they're a trusted accountant as well. So we're sort of aware of the intricacies in that space. And I've got a couple of really great accountants I'm working with, sort of creating that, I guess, bespoke family office sort of feel for these clients. 
And then my retail... Shout out to Proactive Accountants, <laughs> everyone. There, yes, absolutely. Um, and then there's the retail space, which has been obviously the 10 years of well, now 11 years. Over the years, it's really shifted. I, I do find myself working with a lot of women, but I mean, I've got met couple, a lot of couples and they're in that accumulating space. I do have a few pre-retirees and retirees. Um, my focus isn't actually the particular client in itself. It's really their drive and their want to, um, I guess, be on that journey of creating a, a financial roadmap for themselves and they're engaged in that process and they actually want results. And so what's your definition of them being engaged? They're not just sit and forget and hope that I'm, a, I'm waving a magic wand. Uh, that's something they're I They're terrible clients because they, 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 they say nothing when you do well. Yeah. And if you do badly, they're all over you. So they're Correct. hard, aren't they? Uh, yeah. And they're the clients that, you know, they're, they're ones that I've let go of over the years. Yeah, where you, no one else has picked them up either in case no, you're wondering. You just kind of like go, why Why am I justifying my existence with all the work we do behind the scenes? Yep. A, lot, a lot of them don't understand how well, – we make sure our clients do actually understand how much work we do behind the scenes. And if um I have if they aren't aware that I feel like I failed in some respects. And what, what do you do anything from a practice? Is there anything that you uh, show your clients about all that that work? Because it's a bit like an iceberg, right? So mm-hmm. they see the bits they see, but they don't know you're on a hold. And so, ha- is there anything that you do that brings that forward into their lexion? Yes, over time, I have actually. Um, incrementally added this stuff to it and actually we're about to put it on the website too is what to expect when getting advice. I think we've put it on this basic blog but I'm, I'm really wanting to put that in more detail and get people to really understand that there are, you know, there's the regulation that we have as well that we have to adhere to. There's so much. My clients are aware because I'm always saying, you know, we record this meeting, I've got a file note this. Um, after a meeting or if it's a phone call, I email them, they actually see that they've got a note too and I let them know although you might not need this email that's also for your records we've had this conversation so I'm trying you know I, I my clients are aware but what I do in the process we do a proposal we let them know what to expect in the first few months the onboarding process can go for months because it might be yep we might be setting up new enrolling over super or setting up their insurances but there's a cash flow modeling part there's also accountability there might be needs for a bit of mindset coaching where a client sort of going, I'm earning $300,000 and I've got nothing to show for it. I well, need your help. I love that bit because, uh, you know, you, you also have other businesses where, you've, you, where you, you cater for people who potentially aren't at full service financial planning. But so if I'm a client and um, how do you identify that? Because I'll start again. You've said the sort of clients you want are, decision makers who are, who are there, but now you're also saying that sometimes you're, you're happy to give them some scaffolding to help out, huh? provided what they're enthusiastic and genuine, or what's what's the... What I want to see with clients, and I think that really I also ask what they want from me, is um, how are we going to go this on this journey together? So I want them to have an understanding that this is a long-term relationship. And for, it's their journey, right? It is their journey. But they've got to also understand that there is also accountability accountability there. So if I recommend in part of my advice is uh, extra contributions or at the end, end of financial year, we're going to have a meeting, we're going to assess cash flow, and then we're going to do an up sum contribution. They're, they're the things that I expect that they're going to go and do. And if they don't, they come back. So I certain clients have accountability monthly email. Some clients are sort of I just catch up with every, you know, six to 12 months. Um, but they all get updates on, you know, market updates, performance reviews in terms of their portfolios and what's, whatnot. But the whole idea in terms of answering that question, I guess, is the client needs to be aware that they've got work to do themselves. And yep. if they are struggling with that, if they go, look, I really am not good at this. And I hear a lot of women say, I'm falling behind or I'm hopeless with money or whatever. I'm catching them and saying, are you listening to yourself? So I'm all automatically kind of weaving out some of that coaching in there and getting yep. them to think about how they actually, what their relationship is like with money. I then also will have a conversation about that if I sort of see, or they've said, oh, I can't do this, but I put it back on them. It's, yes, you can. This is, we know what your your costs are. We know what your fixed expenses are. We know what your discretionary is, we know what your goals are, we know we're directing a bit of money here and a bit of money over there to achieve those goals. So you've got now the formula in place, it's now up to you to sort of 
keep going with it. It's like going to the gym. You've got to keep flexing those muscles. It's not going to get fit without it. You, uh, you know, if I, if I take you back to that first role where you were supposed to collect money, but you help people out, mm-hmm. um, the comment you made around this is a vocation and the way in which you, you, you do this, you're very human uh, focused and, and human uh, centric. Um, how many clients are you managing given that you've also just pivoted into the, the professionals? And, and do you see, do you see a day where you'll, you'll be taking on, um, other advisors who might just specialize in, the, the high net worth and, and, and maybe retail or what's what's your thoughts around um, being able to do both? I have been a big believer, if you look at the stuff that I do, if, of being able to do it all. But the reality is I can't do it all. So that sort of answers that last question in some respects. Yeah. So I am on a, a bit, bit of a business, business growth plan at the moment and I would like to bring in another team member or two. Um, but in terms of how many clients I'm serving, I've deliberately kept my business quite small for the fact that I don't want to spread myself too thin and I can service these clients. Yep. So um, it varies from one client to another with what they need. Well, you, 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 you're seeing some clients 12 months of the year, right? So so it's mm-hmm. very, very high touch. Yeah, it is very high touch. So I keep, and it wouldn't be surprise you that I've got around 80. That number is actually, I've got to look at that number because I think it's increased. I've had quite a bit of a, influx of new business coming through and um, there's points in the year where I'll put the brakes on and go, I'm not taking on a, a client for a period of time. But at the moment, I've, I've been taking on quite a bit of business. Um, and the you, fact- also, you also have a problem because you've got other businesses that feed and- clients into you, right? You've got- yes. So- so that's what's happening. Yeah, now. yeah. So, so when um, when I look at if you've got eighty clients and they're being serviced, you know, once a year, that's eighty clients. If you've got eighty clients being serviced twice a year, that's like one hundred and sixty years of work, four times, etc. So, when I put my my other hat on, which is where I help businesses um, supply talent um, to drive their 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 firms, I always ask that question because someone with a hundred clients seeing them four times a year is a four hundred unit of work. Thing. And and obviously their fees are up there as well. So so that, that that's fine. Now if I'm um so we can we can reference the rest of this podcast by by saying if anyone's out there and uh, what Amy is is laying down you like, then um why don't we get into a few quick sort of beefy details? Uh, um, uh, who's your AFSL? Um, what's your tech stack? We yeah. want let's let's give these left brain people a bunch of information for them to absorb. Okay, um, my AFSL is. Loyalty Financial Group. Very good, yep. I came- Shout out loyalty. Yep. Um, So Ivan and Andrew, they're great guys. Um, I've been only with them, I think we're hitting a one-year mark very soon. Uh, And I've got to ask, why'd you join them? Um, They understood my business, my model. They actually understood what I wanted to achieve. Um, I've always been about wanting to maintain my autonomy around, you know, approved product lists, the way I do investment. Um, the way we build our portfolios and the way we vet our fund managers and also how I look through, you know, how I manage um, my relationships with, say, insurance providers and whatnot. So I wanted to make sure that I had that autonomy in that respect. That also the sensibility um, brand was still all go all mine. It's separate to how the recap advice business is operating. Um, and they also understood that I had, you know, my focus is now to build a private wealth practice as well within the, within the firm. Um, and that, you know, Brett and I basically work together closely, Brett being my husband, who's sort of very focused on the investment side of the business. Um, so. So they gave you a platform that allowed, yes. allowed you the flexibility to, to pick one of these five or six directions you're going mm-hmm. in. And regardless of which one, they, have- that they weren't going to get in the way. Correct. And they were going to support you, mm-hmm. which, you know, quite often people have the decision of, uh, do I change licenses or do I go self-license? But increasingly there's an emergence of, of licensees like um, loyalty that potentially are a hub and spoke approach where they, they, they're going to take care of a part of it, but allow you that flexibility. Correct. And a big part of that is that compliance piece, making sure that um, everything is above board compliant that, you know, um, especially when I sort of looking at the wholesale space, you know, that was always a concern is have I got, because there's this big void between retail and wholesale. And although I didn't need to do an SOA, I still want to do a strategy proposal scope of work. So it was- It's hard to let go, isn't it? It is. It is. So there was also sort of those kind of things, getting guidance around that, but also um, I guess it's knowing that I've got that 
there if I need. I need that sounding board. I've got the, you know, the team at LFG, um, which has been great. And, um, you know, I've enjoyed working with them so far. So, so far, so good, which is exciting. And what's your tech stack? How do tech you make stack? all this happen? Oh, my God. Um, we can edit that out, the oh, my God, Kieran. What do you think? <laughs> what's that? Um, so uh, this is not a tech podcast. This is now a tech therapy session. Mm. I've discovered um, AI technology, which I'm excited about. Now, I so I do have a podcast, so, you know, little things that we're doing with that, we're using AI technology to basically create our reels and stuff. In terms of the business, there's this. Well, 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 well. We can we can talk about your really? podcast, yeah, oh, absolutely. But, okay, the sensibility that's, podcast. It's just exciting when I discovered AI being like, and it can be an ext- like you're sort of almost an extension of yourself, a personal assistant that does things in seconds. It's mind blowing, and I'm like, oh my god, I, where I'm where has here. it been all my life? Yep. So so Kieran, this yeah, we can chuck one of these links in sensibility. Yeah. Um, looking at some of the things empowering women in finance, changing your financial narratives. Chat, you know. Uh, why fashion and personal style are not the same. So with Ensemble being the positive evolution of financial advice, we're trying to power the advisors, but the advisors have got to make a fist of it out to the stakeholders, which is the general public. Mm-hmm. So so by, by putting your shoulder to that wheel and sort of demystifying a bit of that um, is a good thing. So, yeah, no, tell us, tell us okay. what, what got you into it and, um, yeah, where, where, where to from here? Right, like I needed any more work on my or anything else on my plate during the beginning of the pandemic, um, I started Sensibility in 2020 with a newborn baby and um, two kids in homeschool, well, three, but my my eldest was off at my ex-husband, so it was two kids in homeschool. It was hell of a time, but I really wanted to get the podcast up and running because I was building the um, Sensibility Transformation Money course, which is just a financial literacy platform as part of that brand. But the point of sensibility is really to, um, I guess, make the conversation of money normal and shed light on the value of advice and financial literacy. Um, And I find that I do have a combination of listeners being both advisors, so our community, as well as clients and um, and people who they've shared that with or people who have accidentally come across it and liked it. Um, But the whole really the, the driving force now is to really ensure that it's about with every podcast is going to have some light on financial literacy or, you know, financial well-being and the value of financial advice. So I often get a lot of advisors on the podcast to have a chat with me. Um, and I mean, I think we do all have a responsibility to talk out to uh, the general public, not to ourselves. Well, if we don't about control the importance the, of what we do, if we don't control the narrative, we saw ten years ago there will be other other factions that control the narrative, and that ends up in the toilet. Yeah. So. You know, the one thing, if we had the DeLorean time machine and we went back, we should have been on the front foot. We should have been hot. We should have been putting our clients forward in in in, in political rather than the product providers Absolutely. sort of the narratives. But, you know, we're here where we are now. Mm-hmm. So you've got sensibility. And do, do you get any streams of, of client inquiries through that podcast? I do. And right. I have since with the course. So the course I've <clears throat> initially wanted to launch online and I'm not really great on social media and creating sort of a marketing funnel. So I kind of ditched that idea very quickly and I've rolled that out to corporates and I'm actually rebranding and re- re-recording at the moment. But there is sort of the the, pur- the purpose of that, the education piece is really ensuring that if you're not ready for advice, at least it's preparing you to be ready. And I, I find that if my clients actually have an understanding of how the mechanics of money really are working for them, they are far more engaged in the the advice strategy that, that you've prescribed for them as an advisor. So I do feel that the, we all kind of, as in this space, have that responsibility to keep that conversation going, educating our clients or empowering them is the word I like to use. And the general public, um, you know, there's influencers out there, but I think we could do a better job. My friend Jenny Pierce once said, I think we're an industry that talk, likes to talk to itself. And that's become a problem, as you mentioned, because if we only talk, we know how great we are, but we've got to let everybody else in the country know how great we are. And there's some great people I know in your community that are doing such a good job in that space. But that, the, the other part of it, you've got to keep the lights on, right? So, mm-hmm. so yeah. if I'm um, if I'm your business coach, and you actually have a business coach, you told me earlier, mm-hmm. we'll get onto that in a second. Um, and I'm looking at you've got your core business, um, you've got sensibility. I imagine in sensibility, you're slowly, surely building a following. These are people that will pop up 
you know, whether it be a month, a year or two years and fall into the bucket, which is your professional advice. Um, I've got a feeling you're going to be full pretty soon. So, um, and we, we, one of the, one of the things we just avoided then was your tech stack. Oh yeah. What's your tech stack? So it's not very exciting besides the fact that I've discovered AI. Really, I'm just, I've built my own spreadsheets that is templates. So when I get into a discovery meeting, I just enter as they talk into this, like I just pop in, say what they've got in super, I pop in what their mortgage is, I pop in everything. So I've I've built my own tech stack in a spreadsheet Perfect. thing. I'm a bit of a spreadsheet nerd that way. Um, the other, I guess it's Process Street is one of the yep. tech stacks that I'm, I've been working on for now a year, which although we can have, you know, processes and workflows in things like Advisor Logic or Xplan, this is a really great system because it connects with um, my Outlook. I can automate emails really quickly and we can just track exactly where we are with the pro- with our clients' work. I remember early doors in VBP was one of the things, one of the foundation pieces of software behind the scenes All right, to manage yeah. a lot of things. So Yeah, I, I, I tried so many things like Trello and what's the other one? At Monday, I've tried a lot, but Process Street seems to be the most log- – the way my brain works, I'm enjoying it. I like it. It's really easy to build out and um, we're sort of – we're basically constantly tracking and measuring our process. Because we've been a small team, the reality is that I know I'm going to be – you know, I'm growing. I have got um, – Dr. Catherine Hunt is my um, business coach and I do have a strategy going forward and I know the team is going to expand. So we've really got to make sure we're capturing everything in that process because otherwise it's just in our heads and on something, you know, in the folders and – People, it's it needs. We needed that roadmap. I guess the practice what you preach. We plan everything else for other people. There was a point where I realised in my business that that was where I was failing. Not only myself and the team, but I was failing the growth of the business. If I hadn't Ex- execution's away. hard, right? There's mm-hmm. there's no doubt about it. Execution is really hard. Um, tell me about your uh, your support team who have uh, been looking after you, mm-hmm. um, and uh, tell me about sort of um, what they do for you, your relationship with them. They don't work in the same office. Mm-hmm. So maybe how you get the best out of them, because you did mention that one of your team members you've had for seven years. I'm, yes. I'm really curious. So so you've got yourself and and, and your husband mm-hmm. um, looking after different clients or sometimes the same client. Um, yep. And then you've got some people in your engine room. So. Yep. So Davina, as I mentioned, you, know, you mentioned, has uh, been with me seven years. Um, she's actually in the Philippines. Um, and... She is an integral part of our business. She absolutely, you know, loves our clients, cares for them. In fact, to the point that I've, the clients reach out to her before they reach out to me. Scale, so, scale, yeah, and she's, trust. Yeah, and and so she, they wouldn't even know that she's actually not sitting next to me in my office. Yeah, look, I think COVID just changed everyone's opinion mm. on that. So, so, um, so you've got Davina, and then you've got someone also doing your your parapleting yes. as well. So, just very new. Um, Paraplating has been a pain point like many businesses. It's a cost center. No one likes oh doing God. it. Um, Shout out to the paraplaners listening. Yeah. Love your work, but um, it's it's yeah, it's a necessary evil. Yeah, it but is. You're not evil. Look, I, I'm i still grappling with – I'm not grappling. I'm still undecided on the way forward with this space, and I know um, Matt Esler is listening. He's going to be – probably screaming at this but um because I haven't gone down that road with him um but I am I've got a now a remote power planner yep. I've been testing the water with him and we now quickly do team meetings I because of technology and AI I, think I basically now get a team you know a zoom meeting with a client it's recorded it's um, then, you know, the transcript's written up straight away automatically. So are you using the Zoom AI or yeah. using – Zoom. Okay. Yep. Zoom, Zoom, not exactly the AI, but we've got that and then we're um, – I'm testing a couple of different AI. So I've got a few different subscriptions and playing with them at the moment to find out which is more like – and also my other concern is privacy and cybersecurity. So I, that's why I'm not going to label which one's which right now because I'm still testing the water. But the idea is now with – um, Interpol, was, he's going to sort of, instead of listening to the whole hour of that meeting, it's all there in the meeting notes. We have a meeting. I've got the strategies, the, the spreadsheets there. It's starting to become more of a seamless process. So it's, it's, it's really, really quick yeah. to now go from me writing up hours of notes and then trying to explain to somebody and handing that over and then 
and you know it's that just has cut that process in I'd say more than half. Well, I use a combination of uh, the Zoom and then Copilot, my other business. Yeah. Having it running in internal meetings with your team is also awesome. Yeah, we because, do that too. Because, you know, once you finish with a client, you're motivated to do a file note because it's kind of the law, right? But mm. when you finish an internal meeting, quite often you don't stop and do that 15, 20 minutes of typing who's doing what. You just assume, but the machine does it. Yes. So, you know, it sort of says, well, you know, what are the, what are the action items? And so, you know, if you're listening to this podcast in five years' time, you're going to go, they were newbies. Yeah. But, but you know, it is, it is impressive, right? Mm-hmm. So, so, um, and let's talk about, uh, coaching. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so yourself, um, uh, yourself and your husband own the business, uh, outright yourselves. I own the business. Yep. Um, Brett's a director, but I fully own the business. Yeah. But and will that be the case? So going forward, in order to scale, mm-hmm. and this is this is a uh, you know knowing your backstory and how mm-hmm. hard it was for you to get to here, um, is there will that ever change? Yes, I do. I've played with the idea of um, sort of offering equity. Because you were that young girl many years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I've you know there's lots of ideas. They're up in the air right now. Yep. They haven't fully landed, but. What I do know is that I'm wanting to, you know, I guess grow the business. And, you know, one of my friends, Sasha, started to leverage through an advisor who went out on her own, worked out it wasn't her gig, had a small book and went, I'll bring this in. And I was like, that's a great way for me to start. I've always been very cautious around um, borrowing, lending. I guess that that sort of the single mum, although I'm not a single mum now, I still have that, I guess, you, you, you're back yeah, to around history. borrowing money, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. So I've never gone and borrowed money to buy a book or anything like that. So I've kind of like gone, everything that I've got is because I've built it, um, which has been challenging because I find it hard to let go. But at the same time, it's now great. It, now I see the foundation is quite great. We've got something to work with. And that's not to say in the future I might change and do that sort of a different, move it into a different direction and strategize differently but for where i'm at i'm comfortable with maybe starting that way well leverage is only scary when you don't have a strategy or an execution Mm -hmm. right so i mean i my background was i didn't grow up that wealthy and um i was quite risk averse and so i grew a really big business with very very little debt i look back now thinking if i'd actually just embraced debt because what was i scared of Mm -hmm. the business was functioning um it's just a number right the valuation was way higher than, than that number um and it's probably, you know, one of those lessons I, I try to tell my, 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 my former self or my 20 year younger self, but I can't do that. So that's mm. why we come on a podcast. Mm-hmm. And we, we say to people that not only if your strategy and your execution work, debt shouldn't be scary. And in fact, putting my more mature hat on, if you're looking to ever sell your business um, to whether it's private equity or to another person, they actually like the fact you've got debt in there because it means you've backed yourself. It means that you, you're you willing to back you and your team, which is kind of a bit counterintuitive because, you know, like the old school kind of, you know, uh, baby boomer mentality is very much, well, you're awesome if you paid everything off and everything's yours, right? Whereas these people are like, well, it doesn't seem you back, you know, you don't back yourself. And it's like, oh, first time I heard that, I went, damn, you're right. Another one of those 20-year lessons. Um, and how often do you um, how often do you meet with Catherine? Usually weekly. Wowzers. And I say usually because the last couple of weeks I have been slammed and she's also done Roadshow. Um, so it hasn't been as regular, but we do texts and there is a bit of accountability that she you know, keeps me to. So. Well, you're such an expansive thinker. I, I mean, we, we haven't even got onto the fact that you, 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 you're the chair of the Inspire community for the FAAA, which we'll do a, a bit of a chat about in the moment. But you know, I'm thinking there's five of you, but the reality is there's one of you. Yeah. So if I'm your business coach, I'm probably telling you to scope, scope, scope. Yeah, she's starting to. She's kind of given me, I think she's she's started to do that initially and I think she went, okay, that's going to be too much. And she's kind of given me free reign to a point and she's now pulling me in. And I see what she's doing. She's very I'd clever. I'd love to hear these conversations. She's very clever. I actually chose her because of her psychology degree, her background, and I thought, because I've had other coaches, and I tell you, I I basically sort of run, no, I, I, I kind of 
spin bullshit, let's just say that. I kind of don't, you know, like I will tell them what they hear, kind of what they want to hear. I know she's not going to do that with me. I know she's there, – there is this – I love level. the fact that you're actually giving her the instructions right now on this podcast. I, I deal with you. She, she, no, she, her, we've had this conversation. I, you know, I know that she kind of – she one of my friends, actually, Peter Dim, Peter said this. It's like she kind of creates this little web and then all of a sudden you're in the thick of it. Um, but she's very clever with – She's a highly intelligent woman, and so I really enjoy working with her. But you know, we've we're, we've been working together for some time, and now we're starting to get to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to do these things. Certain things I've pushed back. You know, the amount of meetings she wanted me to do, I was like, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. But I've also recognised, and with working with her, how much I was spreading myself too thin, um, and you know that I was. We look, you know, one of the exercises she did with me was like, Jesus. The amount of work that I've done for free for in the amount of study I've done that's not actually, you know, study in terms of, oh, yeah, there's a degree, but in terms of my own self-study and the books that I've read and all that experience, she kind of brought to my attention that, um, you know, I'm very experienced, but I wasn't valuing myself. And so- Why do you think that was? See, this imposter syndrome thing, it didn't really go away. I was going to say- It's, it's, a, called, yeah. it's called avoidance. Yep. Yeah. And so I've recognized this stuff in me. And this is, I guess, why the you know the money mindset coach becomes the money mindset coach because you recognize the stuff in yourself. So when I started doing coaching, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. now I understand that the brain's working. I sort of realized that, you know, besides the fact that I love neuroscience and neuroplasticity, I started recognizing my own crap and I worked through that. And that's why I like working with someone like Catherine because she calls you out. She can sort of see it, but she also gives you that time to get there. And she's given me that time and I've kind of recognized, yeah, avoidance is one. Keep myself super busy and I have been probably a bit too afraid of some of the successes that are laying before me because I was like, that means change. And I'm, you know, we all have those un- they illogical fears, but that's how the brain works. They're not always real, but there's been things that I've been like, why am I so scared? Oh, look, I'm, you know, I'm, but my wife's banned me from opening out any more any new businesses. So if you're down the line, you want, I'm out for for a little mm-hmm. while. The funny thing is, you're probably going to have more financial security if you stop rather than start new things, which is really mm-hmm. counterintuitive to the expansive mind, right? So, mm-hmm. so you often think about, well, if I just add this to a client experience, if I just add that to a client experience. You know, historically, people would say, if I did their insurance, their mortgages, I did their legals, I did their cash flow, I did all those things, and I did all of it, the client would have a, a great outcome. Now, the client wins, but that might be to the detriment of yourself. Whereas I'm seeing increasingly advice practices um, pick one or two of those and be really, really good at it and share clients. Mm. So you mentioned that happens in the high net worth. Yes. Um, but it's it's also happening in retail. There are Absolutely. Plenty, of, plenty of people out there who are working together. Yep. Now, it's handy if you're in the same license because it's – but if you're not, um, you know, they're working together, they're sharing clients. And, mm-hmm. and um, I, I see that as a way forward because, you know, for those who listen to this podcast, I've said it many times, the medical industry, you don't go to the one doctor for everything. No, it's true. You know, and, and, and but the one, when you do go to a specialist, you're like, well, they are learned, they've read the books, they've done the courses, they're, they're, you know, they've got a, a superpower here and, and, you, and you very easily do that. But in financial planning, it hasn't been that way. Mm. Um, and I think there's an unintended consequence of the regulation. Mm. Um, you know, the, the fact that if you and I were sharing a client and I wasn't in your licensee, the client would have a friction-filled, unpleasant experience if we had to transfer files between each other, you know, but um, which which is something that, that we where there's no quick fix for, but it's part of our, I suppose, the professional growth. Um, I've got here a couple of other quick questions. I'm going to, we're going to come back to charitable because you've got a, a ripper charitable story there. Um, we've got uh, the FAAA. Mm-hmm. Um, you're the chair of the National Community Chair of the Inspire Community. A mm-hmm. couple of questions. Um, how long have you been doing it? And what drives you? Uh, okay, how long have we'll, we we'll include some links too, Kieran, to the FAAA. Mm-hmm. For those who, who are familiar with it, you probably should be, right? So um, jump yeah. on. So I became national chair just recently. I think Dawn called me on in summer holidays. So Dawn Thomas was the national chair prior to me. At summer holidays, that's right. It was January and she said, I'm stepping down and you're going to j- jump into my shoes. Oh, you got, like, you got, what? what? 
volunteered? She was... basically told me. Um, you Volunt- told. You, you got told. I got told. Don't say no. You can't say no to Dawn. She's too charming. You can't say no to her. Um, so I was kind of like, okay, look, I'll give it a go for a year. Let's see how I go. But prior to that, I was national chair for New South Wales. Yep. Now, it was with AFA before. So Inspire is a brand like the brand that uh, AFA had or community of practice. I shouldn't say brand, but we've taken on new branding for Inspire. Community of practice with AFA. I think believe that it started in 2013 or was it 2014 so I did start it good 10 years ago and I remember going to one of the first Inspire events here in Sydney and just going oh my god I am not the only woman in the room this feels really comfortable I didn't you know I felt like oh I feel like I found my my tribe I felt like I found bit I felt seen and heard and it, it just sort of shifted something in me because there are many times. And there wasn't a golf hole anywhere near. No, that's right. There have been many times in my career early on that I'd feel really alone because I'm self-employed. You know, you big teams. I, I'd gone from corporate to sort of by myself. So having that community, having that network was really important. And that was similar to when, you know, after not so long after, it was XY Advisor community as well. So I was kind of involved with both. But the Inspire piece really was a driver for me to feel connected and the mentoring and I remember seeing, you know, the people like um, Deborah Kent just uh, standing up in at a roadshow in front of hundreds of people talking and I was like, wow, I, I'd love to be like that. Like I wouldn't, you know, a woman in financial services, who knows, you know, she's she's amazing. And, you know, it was actually Deborah sort of suggested I get involved and be a co-chef in New South Wales and right. I was like, oh, my God. It was sort of one of those moments you pinch yourself and go, well, she she knows me. She knows who I am. <laughs> um, and I think in that space, it is where we get to be seen. But it's a pl- it's a place where I guess community um, that women are not the minority, but it's also about where we can actually ensure that there is more equality in financial services, particularly in um, you know financial advice, where we're still only really representing twenty percent. Yeah, no, it's um, and, and that that's a that's a figure that really hasn't moved. No, you know, despite um all of their initiatives despite that. And we spoke off air mm-hmm. that one of the structural reasons why, and you have a forum right now, there's quite a few people listening. If you could change something um, in the way in which uh, women come into our industry or stay in our industry that was sustainable, what would it be in relation to the training in the PY? Uh, expanding the PY period, like the professional year is li- you know quite limited. But if you're a working mother, you can't do that full time. So that would in- instantly limit a woman who's got children to go um, and do a PY if that was her you know, opportunity. The other thing is- Sorry, I get- just, just, just slow that down. So at the moment, your PY is a fixed term rather mm-hmm. than outcome based. Yeah, I think it is. It's There's certain time frames that yep. things have to be done. Yep. Now, if- but, but if you're a working mum and you, and you would want to keep, and you want to move into this and you're building- so that when your kids are at primary school or, or whenever you feel comfortable, you can move into it, it doesn't really work for you. It's not flexible. And wow. the, other, the other part of it is, I guess, flexibility around or pro-rated um, CPD. Like that's – it doesn't matter whether we work full-time, part-time, we've got to get those that CPD. So if you're – you know, I know many of us have been in situations where we go, yep, I'm good with CPD, and then you actually look at your, you know – which, which categories you actually need to, and you've got to stop what you're doing, get that caught up for that year, you know, to keep going. And then finally, it's also, well, I understand, um, and gosh, I hope I'm, you know, I might be wrong here, but my understanding is also the, um, you know, CFP, I'm not very familiar with that because I haven't done that. Um, but in terms of they've got the similar to the professional year, you've got a period of time that you've got to do your, um, Practical work. Now, what if you're, again, working mum, you're power planning, you're working part-time, that can be a challenge. And I'm speaking only because I know of a couple of women who's been struck, like haven't actually completed certain things because they can't. They can't do that because of their family situation. And if we just increase the time frame by 50%, would that... I think we need to actually consider individual circumstances yep. and actually... Well, it's hard to legislate. I know, that's hard to legislate, but if... You understand if it's done part time or full time. Let's look at if I'm going to do a university degree, I've got a period of time that I've got I can do that over a few, you know, several years. Oh, quite a long time. You know what I mean? Exactly. Correct. It should be something. There should be consideration of that, 
and actually go over that period of time, you've done those many hours, you've met those requirements. Um, it's not actually you've got to do this by this date, like within this time frame. I think there needs to be flexibility in that that year that or that professional year, which I think is about an eighteen month process. But what? I understand that if there's so many little setbacks, yeah. and just even from one of my one of the committee members in the FAA at Spire in New South Wales, she was telling me some challenges, even so, just getting things in order to get it all done. What's interesting and frustrating is that. It's not as if there hasn't been female representation in the levels of government that were in charge of making this legislation over the years. So, um, yeah, that, that that was something. When you mentioned that to me, I went, oh, goodness, if you take a little bit too long, then you've got to start again. And, and that's that's got to be the reason. And, and I look at practices holistically. Um, and if you look at it, if you got all of the people in financial planning, and so roughly, um, you know, there might be 16,000 ARs, and I think they employ about 120,000 people, ends up being about 50-50 in an office. Mm. So there are a lot of lot of females who want to be in the financial services industry because they like giving and whatnot, but they find themselves in roles that aren't going to be strictly the AR, and that's probably because of what you've just mentioned. I've spoken to many women who are mums who are juggling work and study. It is so challenging. I think, I mean, we all have to do it. I think it's great. We've you can got, do it in the law industry. You can do it in accounting. Correct. Yeah. We've, it's fantastic that we have lifted our education standards. We've lifted our, you know, we're, we're, you know, considered in terms of that level of professionalism. But I do think that there needs to be more flexibility and consideration of a working parent, not just mums, but like we, if anyone's listening, I'm sure you've all had moments where you're just going, oh my God, I've got to get this assignment in. I've got this exam and I've got all these file notes that I've got to finish or I've got, you know, three more client meetings and an SOA to write. There's a lot of work that we do in our day jobs and then this is another layer of on top. Now, add to that, I've got, a, a, you know, a toddler that's sick. I've got kids at home. Yep. Um, now we're out of toilet paper. I've, you know, there's just so many things that just throw, you're thrown. Um, and it's not just women, but I do know that this is a, this can be challenging for women, and I think there needs to be some more flexibility in, in how we bring women into financial planning. Well, we discussed it. I give you a forum for that. Yeah, I totally you. and Natalie endorsed that, and and it was something that um, uh, I I mean p- part of being part of Ensemble and and doing the All Advisor PD Day. Part of that was that you know you can you can very quickly get your ten points all in one day if, um, and have the flexibility of being at home. And you know, in the back of our mind, we thought exactly that sort of cohort would really benefit. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the positive byproducts. But what we didn't realise is if you don't have it done within a certain number of years, then then the clock stops, right? So, um, which is which is which is um, uh, I suppose. Yeah, just just another one of our own goals mm. that we've done legislatively. But it also means that, and and a challenge I'm going to put to yourself at the end um, uh, is, do you scale really is scale of your engine room is 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 seems like the way to free you up time, mm-hmm. right? So you've started this journey, you've got your back office, um, but you keep bringing in new clients with all of the other ventures you've got. Mm. And that's only exacerbating your problem. Mm, so, I know. Are you I'm sounding be- like you're sounding, <laughs> sounding very much like a, a business coach here, and I'm getting a coaching session. No, oh, well, we're, but, 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 loving but, it. But we have a silver lining, which mm. is, um, your your remote, um, mm-hmm. a lot remote first at the moment. Is that right? So a lot of your clients see you remotely, some in offices, etc. So so now you've got flexibility, um, which is great. Would you are you looking for someone to come in and bring a client base and work with you? Are you you know what what would be your objective? You know, if I spoke to you in a year's time and I said, um, did you do the thing we spoke about? What mm. would the thing be? Well, now I'm being recorded. Uh, here we go. Like I'm now held accountable to a lot of people. Um, absolutely, that's sort of what my I've got my sights on. Bring a, an, another advisor who, I guess, like minded who wants sort of to be on this growth journey. And may not have, you know, realised how tough it is out there on their own, and wants to actually be partnered into a business. Or well, they know how tough it is on their oh, own. Oh, yeah, exactly. But once they start, they go like, "Oh God," Correct. you know, like that's the thing. Um, and there's, I always say, it's it's something you really have to be passionate about when you start your own business and have a big, you know, big why. Why is it that you're here? Why you're doing it? Um, and but in this case, yeah, I wouldn't mind having someone who's 
sort of gone out there on their own but went, you know, I want something that's already structured, already built, already existing and partner into that. And, and you've got the investment side done, which, and, you know, yeah. if you're starting from scratch, that stuff takes two or three years. Oh, that's challenging. Like yeah. constant, there's so much work behind the scenes that yeah. um, we do in that space. Um, and, you know, like, for example, this morning I was on the phone to a fixed income fund manager. We're doing our DD because we're going to move one off and put one in. But there's there's a process. Shout out to the incumbent uh, yeah. who may or may not know they're on the way out. <laughs> um, but there's a process that we've got to go through. And we've had to make a few changes over the last few years because it's been a lot of shifts in our current economy, you know, our global economy, not just Australia. So, yes, there's a lot that is involved, but, yeah, I'd love to have someone who would be going, yeah, I would like to work in that kind of... Well, they've got to share your same values, right? Exactly. And and, and uh, one of the segues here is that we, we spoke earlier about, you know, um, quite often I ask business owners, you know, do you donate to charity? Have you got anything like that? And your answer was... I'm a director of a charity. In case you, in case this lady needed any more work. Um, so, tell me about the charity. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, tell me about sort of its vision and, you know, we'll we'll put the link in there. If other people are interested, then they can get behind it as well. Brilliant. Um, the charity is called the Equanimity Project. Um, I came across it when I was building the Sensibility Money Transformation course because I wanted to be able to create um, something where someone's buying into the course, they're, they're also sort of investing, so they're paying forward. So I wanted to link it to a charity where a percentage goes to something. And I didn't know – what that charity was, but um, you know, serendipitously, the next day I'd made that decision, I met the founder of this charity, um, Karen, and the charity is about well, focused on helping women in that are vulnerable, more so around domestic violence, women who are fleeing domestic violence. And that's financial coercion as well, and financial coercion, yeah. absolutely, and also women over fifty-five facing homelessness. Most what we see is. Um, women don't really want to go and, you know, stay in a refuge. They're not wanting to live in their cars. And we're dealing with, especially in Sydney, you know, women who are highly intelligent but being stuck in a really tough, tough situation. They've got their kids with them. They've got their pets. Um, and we've got sort of a really great system within the charity that helps sort of bridge that gap. And we've also working with some philanthropists and we're you know, looking at doing, um, you know, a great deal of, property deal coming up soon. So there's lots there that's in the pipeline that we're excited about, but we really are about raising a lot of money because uh, at the moment there's a lot of you know, volunteers, including myself. My job in the, you know, as a director is really to sort of oversee the the structure of the business and uh, sorry, the organization, where money's being spent, where we need to be focusing on how we're going to, you know, our growth strategy, all of those kind of things you do when you're on a board. Um, but having that, you know, also for me, I find Karen is sort of also spreading herself very thin. So it's like, you know, helping, working out, creating a process for that, uh, for getting the right people to support her in, in the charity as a charity grows. Um, yeah, so it's it's been very fulfilling, probably a bit more than I could chew initially because I was only just wanting to start, like get a charity involved. But next thing I was asked to be on, on the board, but I'm very proud of the work that um, we're doing. Well, the thing about attracting people to work with you um, uh, in your group is that people uh, want to get a feel for you know what you're all about, your core, you know what you stand for, and I believe that the you know after today the reoccurring theme is you've you've got a real passion in helping people, and you've got a real passion in helping helping in particular women, women who've gone through things, and we're not talking about a minority here. Um, the statistics on on a uh, single or or divorced women in their fifty five to sixty five years old homelessness rates is 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 just outrageous considering they're probably someone's mum they're probably mm-hmm. someone's sister someone's daughter so you know the 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 way in which um, even our superannuation um, regime is just it, it just galls me that it's um uh, you know the legislators just seem to be blind to gender and the fact that people have time off. They're short-sighted and they're only really enough, you know, politicians really doing what they've got to do in a few few short years. They're not looking at the big picture. Um, and, yes, we have a massive problem with gender wealth gap and that's the highest demographic facing homelessness are women over 55 in this country, which is just not acceptable. What we're seeing, especially in the eastern suburbs, we're seeing 
that um, that's happening a lot. You've got high educated women that are going through divorce or widowed all of a sudden going, oh my God, I just trusted that my husband had this sorted out. And it's because also that generation, that was what we were, they were raised to believe that a man looks after the finances and, you know, you make, you be the homemaker. And there's, that doesn't work, not in this world. And quite often when they do a property settlement, mm. um, they're left with the family home, which is not an income generating asset, right? So it sounds like a great thing, but ultimately. Uh, but what if he's gambled it all and you don't know he's refinanced five yeah, times? You, you might have a second or third mortgage you're not aware exactly. of, right? So, so yeah, look, there's, there's, um, uh, it's a it's a it's a really tragic kind of um, uh, scenario, but um, you know I wanted to get a feel for for yourself now. When we're talking uh, about the engine room and building out businesses, what we wanted to do is we wanted to talk to people who are in a really big business. We wanted to talk to people who are starting, and we wanted to talk to people who are at the crossroads. Mm-hmm. Which I believe you're at the crossroads mm-hmm. as far as not not your passion, not your purpose, but as far as being able to execute on. On a lot of these things, and so your next steps from here, and and no, I'm not your business coach because mm-hmm. Catherine, Catherine is, but but um, if if I'm listening and I want to get in touch with you, we'll get the links there. Mm-hmm. Um, if you know, in relation to your role at the FAAA, there's probably a lot of women who see you now as you saw your previous uh, mentor who would like to get in touch. You are approachable, mm-hmm. so so reach out. Um, where do you see businesses? in financial planning ending up as far as the different models? Oh, God, that's a good question. I haven't been called that before, Kieran. Uh, look, I'm not exactly sure where I see businesses end up, but what I'd like to see is that there we, we you know, a greater reach to more Australians and maybe more advisors in, in this profession. Um, and I would like to see that the value of advice be something that most Aussies ha- actually – understand and aware of that they could go, right, I've got my trusted advisor. I've got my accountant, but I've got my trusted advisor and how lucky am I? I'd love to see that. That's what I think is where I'd like to see the direction of our profession go, that we're that number, we're that person that they call. And I know I've- But I doubt that's changed in 20 years. I I don't think it's changed, but I think that what's going to change is actually the general public having a different perspective. That's what I would like to see change. We all believe that we're great at what we do, and I do believe that we're great at what we do. I think that, you know, I know that when my client's husband died, I was that person they called that day, and I was on speakerphone with her and a daughter who's also a client, um, with the family. I was there. I was in that conversation, you know. Um, that that speaks volumes that I'm the trusted advisor in that position, situation, but – a lot of advisors, a lot of people, the general public, Australians don't know that relationship yet. And I'd love to see more people go, yeah, um, I guess what? I've got a new advisor. Fantastic. So excited because I've got someone in my corner and having that, you know, different thinking, whereas we've still got a bit of work to do. Yeah, we do. And there's not enough of us. No, there's okay. not enough of us. There's not enough of us. And the, the, the way in which uh, the government has portrayed this is we're seen as a luxury good. Mm. Um, most financial planners got into the industry with uh, exactly the same sentiments as you're saying around helping people. Most of them haven't come from wealth. They've just come from you know nice nice backgrounds, got educated, worked their way through. They're now just making rich people richer, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, they do take advice and whatnot. But um, if, if I could, uh, I suppose, articulate where, where, where you're coming from is that we need – we passionately need successful financial planning businesses from a profitability, from a scaling perspective at the grassroots in order to be able to have a chance at, at, at doing that. And if we're all going to be sort of kept in small businesses that are moving forward, well, we're going to be price takers when it comes to whatever the winds have changed to. Uh, but Amy, I can't thank you enough for spending time today with the engine room and, and ensemble and you've... You've been a great friend of Ensemble for many years, but also all the other um, endeavours you do. A lot of people, um, uh, uh, you know, in social media, they're, they're the people who watch you and they don't they don't interact, but you're definitely someone who gets out there front and centre, says yes, put your hand up, and um, is quite inspirational to a whole generation of not just female, but male advisors as well. So thank you very much for spending some time in the engine room. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and hopefully next time we catch up, I've grown... Maybe gotten over my fears and over myself a bit more. 
Well, you know what? The authentic vulnerability is completely it. And I think it's it's not just necessary. It's not just on trend, but um, uh, the truth is such an easy commodity to have, uh. um, you know, and uh, uh, if you're new to financial advice and you find yourself, you know, maybe not being as confident of your background, I can tell you that the wealthy clients all started somewhere as well. That's right. That's and, and they've all got stories as well. Absolutely. Some of my very wealthy clients, and I've got clients that are worth, you know, over 100 mil now, it's um, have started very humbly. And they're the easiest people to get along with, salt of the earth kind of people. And I've also always wanted to close the podcast off with using the word bullshit in the last 30 seconds. Those wealthy people can call bullshit if you're not authentic. Absolutely. And with that, thank you very much, Amy. Thank you.